Welcome to More Than The Score 2021, and I'm Althea Brooks. I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the Office of Engagement, and it is indeed a pleasure to see all of you here. You know, when we plan these programs in, uh, over the summer, we're not sure who would show up, and this year we were really nervous. Um, who will show up in the midst of COVID? So we're, we're thankful that you're here. Welcome. Um, and we plan more than the score with the Alumni Association each year to bring you uh, this wonderful lecture series before each home football game. And a special thanks to uh, both the Alumni Association and the Lifetime Learning staff and the Office of Engagement staff that work these events each Saturday mornings before the home football games. Uh, thank you for joining us at Newcomb Hall. This is not our home, um, but we, we like visiting it. We will return next week, October 23rd, for more than the score at Alumni Hall with Larry Sabato. Who will be there? All right. Uh, we extend a special welcome to our guests who have registered from around the world for the live stream today. We have over 600 people who registered for that, for the live stream. Uh, we're thrilled to welcome uh, Andrew O'Shaughnessy to More Than the Score. This is his first More Than the Score talk. Um, he'll be speaking about his new book on Thomas Jefferson's idea of the university, of a university. Um, and the bookstore will be selling Andrew's book uh, following this program. And he uh, has agreed to stick around and sign a few copies. So I hope you'll buy one. They make great Christmas gifts is what Larry Sabato would say. Uh, before we begin, I want you to go ahead and silence the ringer on your phone. Silence your phone, and we ask that you hold your questions to the end. We've placed microphones here and here in the aisle. If you'll step up and um, ask your questions, go ahead and give your, your name and your UVA affiliation, and uh, feel free to keep your mask on. We can hear you just fine. Um, and thank you for wearing your mask today after you've eaten your donut, drank your, co drink your coffee. Uh, go ahead and put your mask back on. Um, now to introduce our speaker for the morning. Andrew O'Shaughnessy is the Saunders Director uh, of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello and the Professor of History in the Cochran Department of History at the University of Virginia. He's the author of the, f of the following books, The Men Who Lost America, the British Leadership, the American Revolution. This book won the 2014 George Washington Book Prize. Fate of the Empire, uh, published in 2013. An Empire Divided, the American Revolution and the British Caribbean, published in 2000. Andrew will speak today on his recently published book. I'll go ahead and turn this on so you could see his book. Uh, and this book is published by the University of Virginia Press. Andrew is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, a member of the McNeil Center for Early American Studies uh, Advisory Council, and he sits on several advisory boards. Andrew is well-connected around the world. Every time I contact him, he is in a different country. <laughs> He's a friend, a colleague, and an excellent travel companion. He was our lead faculty for the Lifetime Learning Summer Program at UVA at Oxford, held at Oxford um, University in 2013, and then again in 2019. He's a fantastic speaker. Please help me welcome Andrew O'Shaughnessy to More Than the Score. Thank you, Althea, for that lovely introduction. These sentiments are entirely reciprocated. Uh, in fact, Althea appears in the acknowledgments of this uh, book. And welcome to you, the audience. I must say it's a treat to see live people and to be in a room with people. Oh, thank you. And I, I've often thought uh, at these football matches that it would be fun to invite the sealed knot. Uh, they are the British reenactors of the Cavaliers. <laughs> and so instead of having one cavman 
charging onto the field, you could have an entire cavalry and regiment of pikemen. Uh, of course, the term cavaliers is correctly uh, known to be assumed by students as a result of the cavalier song in the early 1920s, but the term actually has a much longer history in Virginia. Many of the Virginia elite like to refer to themselves as cavaliers, and there is uh, some truth to the tradition that they were associated with the British supporters of the monarchy in the English Civil War. Uh, Virginia uh, was alone, along with Barbados, as a colony that continued to hold out in support of Charles I. It was the only colony to have a member of the House of Lords come here, Lord Fairfax, whose family, in fact, lived here uh, for a couple of centuries before returning to uh, England uh, in about 1900. Uh, and of course, George Washington's family were cavaliers. Um, there is, though, a larger element of myth, uh, because many people, just uh, white settlers, came here as indentured servants and certainly weren't part of any privileged uh, class. So the headline of this book is that it's almost uh, unparalleled for any head of state anywhere in the world and at any time to have devoted so much time and attention to overseeing the creation and then the implementation of that idea of a university. Uh, even if I uh, broaden it, and instead of saying head of state, talk about individual founders of uh, universities, uh, and there are many um, places like Rice University was founded by an individual, University of North Carolina, New College, Oxford, but it's difficult to think of a parallel of any of them who uh, were involved in every aspect of the university. Obviously, as a self-trained architect, Jefferson designed the university and designed it in such a way as to familiarize students with every uh, aspect of, um, and every type of uh, classical architecture, you know, Doric, uh, Corinthian, Ionian, etc. Um, as a surveyor, or rather the son of a surveyor, uh, he physically surveyed the uh, property. Um, this is one of his first drawings of the land of what would become the uh, University of uh, Virginia. As a bibliophile, uh, he wrote down and chose all of the books for the library. Uh, the actual list is over 6,000 books, which made it immediately the second largest university library in America other than Harvard, and it was equaled by Yale. But that was quite remarkable given that those universities had been founded so much earlier. As an intellectual, he designed the courses. This is uh, his design, or the books, rather, that he uh, recommended for the teaching of um, Anglo-Saxon. Uh, he even served as the secretary to the Board of Visitors, while also being the rector. Uh, I no one ever wants to volunteer to take the minutes at a meeting, although it is quite smart because, of course, the person who writes the minutes essentially gets the last say and is able to gloss on exactly uh, what happened, uh, which is revealing of Jefferson's general political savvy. Um, he entertained all of the students at the university at least once, uh, usually in groups of three to 12 on a Sunday 
evening. Those who had religious objections, he would invite during the weekday. We have a marvelous description uh, of one of those uh, gatherings with which I opened the book, a dinner attended by a student at Monticello. Uh, the student was called Henry Tutwiler, who later went on to be the first um, president of uh, the University of Alabama. And he told this account at the 50th reunion of the alumni. The Alumni Association began quite early. Uh, and so this was in 1875, 50 years after the university had opened its door. And he gave a wonderfully detailed description and he described how Jefferson was going slightly deaf and would push back his chair during these dinners because he didn't want to discourage the students from talking. In fact, what he really wanted to do was observe them talking to each other and engaged in conversation. Uh, one of his granddaughters described these dinners as a feast of reason. He also described in some detail Jefferson's own daughter, Martha, whom he said should actually be commemorated at the university, that her sacrifices had helped him uh, focus on uh, building the university. But he, she described how Martha uh, would gently tease Jefferson during these dinners. She really acted as the hostess and uh, she firstly said to the students um, when Tuckweiler had dinner there that uh, Jefferson didn't like novels and that they tried to get him to read novels and they'd given him the, some of the novels of Sir Walter Scott and he disliked them. But uh, having, she then proceeded to say she loved herself reading the legal works of Sir William Blackstone. Now, Blackstone's commentaries were one of the most popular guides to the English legal system. And Jefferson had almost wanted them banned at the university because he thought it would turn Americans into Tories and into satellite British subjects. And so I, it was really, she was gently prodding him, saying how much she enjoyed uh, reading this book. Uh, Jefferson even supervised for a period the building of the university, acting as his own clerk of works. Uh, he estimated the number of bricks for every building, and it was clearly quite an authority, not just on architecture, but building techniques. He had his own tools and seems to have known how to use them and occasionally gave demonstrations to craftsmen on uh, the best methods and the effects that he uh, wanted. Uh, his very last visit to the university, uh, he went to Pavilion 7 where the books for the library were being stored as the rotunda was finished and he started opening the boxes of books and he pulled out a copy of Edward Gibbon the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which had been published in 1776. And the English had regarded it as a premonition of what might be about to happen to their own empire in America. And he looked at the back of the spine and said to the student librarian, you should not have accepted this book. The name of Gibbon is misspelled. Uh, in other words, though, he was unpacking the boxes of books. He then went up onto the balcony to watch the uh, new colonnades for the rotunda being installed. I mean, he almost saw the university uh, fully completed. Um, the rotunda was the last building. Well, this story has always been treated as an epilogue to Jefferson's career. Uh, Biographers spend very little time on it. Uh, 
to get this story at all, you would have to read uh, some of the previous histories of the University of Virginia, which means that it's a story largely just known to uh, the alumni and faculty here. Uh, and even those histories tend not to talk a great deal about Jefferson himself. Uh, my book is a dual biography of Jefferson and the university. And really my argument is to understand the university, you need to understand Jefferson. And obviously, uh, he regarded as one of the three great achievements of his life, along with the Declaration of Independence, and the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. He wanted these to be put on his tombstone as what he regarded as great accomplishments. And I would argue that it does indeed rival his other accomplishments, especially when seen in the context of his general plans for education. Uh, because the university was just the apex of his uh, plans for a public education system, which would include a public school system. Had that been implemented in 1779, it would have been the only public school system anywhere in the world. Now, like the Declaration of Independence, the university did not fully realize all his aspirations. Uh, there were some real weaknesses. And really, these have been focused on more recently than the achievements. One of those weaknesses was that the university was meant to be a public university. It was meant to have scholarships. It became the most expensive university in America after Harvard. Uh, also, there were no scholarships originally, even though Jefferson had insisted that there should be scholarships, and he was very insistent it needed to be a public university. There were no uh, scholarships. Another criticism made is that Jefferson planned a three-tier system in Virginia, like a pyramid in which boys and girls would be educated for at least three years, that is, those who were uh, free subjects, not enslaved people. Although, as he pointed out later, his bill did not exclude um, free uh, black uh, people. And it would also then, they would go on to a grammar school, the better ones, and then the very best would go to university. But the idea of public schools fell by the wayside. His bill during the American Revolution to create such a system did not uh, succeed, uh, even though he continued to try in uh, later life. He wanted the university to be for the illimitable freedom of the human mind, but many have pointed out a contradiction in that he also wanted it to espouse Republican ideas of the Republican Party. And he was very particular about how law would be taught and how politics. And of course, it was blighted by the presence of slavery, which was true of all colleges in the uh, South. Uh, this has been a focus of much work recently. It's an important corrective, and I do indeed absorb a lot of this material into my book. It was very useful. Nevertheless, the criticisms have tended to outweigh uh, the achievements, and I think the current attitude is best summarized by Roger Geiger, who did a book on the history of universities up until the uh, Second World War in America, and he said, well, the University of Virginia, and it's an excellent summary of higher education, uh, and actually of many features of this university, but he concludes that the University of Virginia was basically a finishing school for aristocrat 
Arctic planters, and that there was therefore no model for other parts of the country. So my book is actually arguing that like all the other achievements on his tombstone, uh, the university was in fact revolutionary. Uh, it did have a real impact on American higher education, which I'll describe uh, later. And that the story is important for people beyond just the alumni of the university and beyond this university. It has a general importance for higher education in America. I was fortunate enough to write this at Monticello, where I also run the uh, center there for research. Um, it was fortunate because I was in many of the spaces that he inhabited. Uh, you know, if I can use a current lyric from Broadway, uh, this is the room where it happened, uh, except this is really the house where it happened. Um, and that was immensely useful. I mean, we have everything from the tables on which he drew, the plans for the university. You can see many of the ideas and architectural styles which he then readapted for the university, including the Delorme form dome, which he first saw in Italy the same night that he met Maria Cosway. And he was looking at her and the dome at the same time and was in a mood of absolute elation. And he, re he recreated it uh, on several uh, occasions. And my chapter on architecture begins with her because uh, before he died, he was still writing to her. And he uh, described how he was creating this academical village in uh, Virginia, as he liked to call it, because he liked to see it as a village of buildings, as a community. And she, at the time, was running, uh, surprisingly, uh, a convent school and uh, was also interested in education. And she was interested in architecture because her brother was working with Benjamin Latrobe in Washington on the design of uh, buildings in uh, Washington. But I was also very fortunate to be doing this at Monticello because uh, I supervise a team of 10 people who are doing nothing but editing the documents for this period. Uh, they're doing the uh, Jefferson Papers for the retirement period they produce one volume a year. They're meant to be the definitive volumes for the retirement period, especially a high proportion of his letters have never been reproduced, and especially those letters coming back to him have never been reproduced. And it has given me new material for this book. Uh, for example, the descriptions of the ground laying ceremony. I've only really ever seen a, a paragraph in most books. And I always thought there must be more information. You had three presidents present, present Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. And Monroe was acting president at the time. I thought there must be a lot more. And you know, the Freemasons conducted the ceremony and indeed, they have several descriptions of it in great detail uh, with all the fanfare, uh, even the details of the music that was being played by the band. Um, perhaps one of their greatest insights, although this was, uh, these were documents hidden in plain sight. Uh, historians had known about them. They just hadn't used them. Uh, they have three drafts of the Rockfish Gap Commission. The Rockfish Gap Commission of 1818 was the, essentially the blueprint of the university, setting out the curriculum, uh, every detail of the university. It was supposedly the work of some 22 commissioners who met at Rockfish Gap, a stunning location between here and Stanton. And 
In reality, Jefferson had written the report before they met. He'd actually, or he'd actually written three drafts and continued to refine the drafts, clearly with politics in mind. And the commissioners pretty well consented to everything. There were some changes of detail. But basically, what appeared in that report was what Jefferson had written. And I think one feature of Jefferson that's revealed by this book is his political cunning. And you see it all of the time. Uh, you know, he even uh, said um, to a visitor, the visitor asked him, why didn't you just give one price for the university? When you did cost estimates, why did you keep doing them for each building rather than for the entire university. And Jefferson laughed and said, because you can only stuff one hot loaded potato down a man's throat at a time. So it emerges as a lot more cunning. But as I said earlier, this was a revolutionary university in so many ways. For one thing, it was really the first secular university in America. Uh, the, the, the University of Transylvania, which I have to admit, when uh, someone said, have you looked at the University of Transylvania, I left puzzled, thinking, why would I look at a university in Romania? Uh, this is, of course, in Kentucky, and it predates the University of uh, Virginia. And it, it experimented with being a secular university, but very quickly reverted from that, similarly with the University of North Carolina. I cannot tell you how unique this was, because at every college in America, you not only had to attend chapel, you usually had to attend chapel as a student twice a day. They were all religious colleges. And for Jefferson, it was essential if there was to be true intellectual freedom, that it must be free from political and religious uh, restraints. And um, this, I think, was one of his most important guiding principles, why he wanted it to be a public university. William and Mary at this time was private, and he tried to secularize William and Mary and failed. It was one of the reasons he wanted it in Charlottesville, quite apart from being able to control it, because this was the most interdenominational center. Uh, there were really just three churches, uh, the Presbyterians, the Anglicans, um, and uh, uh, one other that I can't think of at the moment. I, I, yeah. And uh, they would actually share a building to have their um, services. And that it meant that there was no one single dominant denomination here. Um, so the secularity was unusual. The other feature that perhaps was the most influential at the time was Jefferson's idea of an elective curriculum where students uh, could choose their courses. This is now a basic hallmark of education, higher education in the United States. Um, but at the time, it was novel. William and Mary, University of North Carolina, had introduced uh, something similar, but it was really the University of Virginia that popularized it. One of the people who visited Jefferson at this time was George Tickner, a young professor at Harvard, who also had the uh, uh, experience of having studied in Germany, which at the time was being regarded as uh, the most important university uh, in the different states in, of Germany in terms of pioneering uh, new uh, work, especially um, in literature. Uh, among universities generally. 
And Tigner tried to take this back and introduce it uh, at Harvard. Uh, he was only partially successful. Uh, it largely was introduced in Spanish and uh, modern languages. But we can show lots of places. Uh, uh, you know, Charles uh, William Eliot, uh, who was one of the great um, presidents at Harvard and one of the reforming presidents with an influence on higher education in the middle of the 19th century, he picked up on uh, this elective curriculum at the University of Virginia and wanted very much to introduce it at Harvard. It's also very important as one of the pioneer public universities in America. Indeed, the South generally plays a major role in pioneering public universities. It's uh, a feature that's almost gone unnoticed. And the university, or what is now the University of South Carolina, then South Carolina College, and the University of Virginia are the first two universities in the country not only to be public, but to uh, have received income annually from their states. Most universities that were called public really didn't receive very much from their states. Georgia claims to be the first public university in America, and so does the University of North Carolina. Uh, that's because the University of North Carolina uh, was actually built and started having classes before the University of Georgia, but Georgia on paper is the oldest and has the older uh, charter. Another uh, theme is that Jefferson wanted to have a star faculty, and these are a couple of pictures of uh, faculty members. This is Rob Lee Dunglinson, uh, who ran the School of Medicine and uh, Bob Gibson, who's a senior professor of cardiology at the university, has written a wonderful history that's still in manuscript, arguing that the medical school here played a pioneering role in medicine generally in America. Doug Lidson wrote a book while he was here uh, that gave him the title Father of American Physiology. George Tucker, uh, was another professor here. He um, wrote the first science fiction novel in America about life on the moon. He did a novel about the Shenandoah Valley in which he went to live in some of the most uh, primitive areas of the Shenandoah to get a sense of the life, the language, uh, and to try and replicate it faithfully. He's also one of America's top early economists. This is one of the first uh, universities where economics um, was taught. And uh, this is just one of the Jefferson's quotes about how he intended to spend his remaining days uh, devoted to the university. The point is um, that uh, he modeled the university really on his own uh, experience at college at William and Mary. Uh, he was influenced uh, by three uh, professors. One was William Small, or that they weren't all professors, William Small, who was from Scotland and had first-hand acquaintance with the ideas of the Scottish Enlightenment. Another was George Wythe, who later became a professor at uh, the College of William and Mary, but at the time uh, essentially gave Jefferson law classes as a sort of intern. And then also uh, Governor Francis Fakir. And the three of them would meet for musical evenings and conversation. And Jefferson really wanted to uh, replicate that those kinds of conversations as he did at his dinner parties for students. What he wanted was to have a university that was paternal, in which the professors lived among the students, even dined 
with the students and in which uh, there was an almost family-like atmosphere. Uh, uh, and that is what he wanted to imbibe into uh, the university. What I find remarkable is the comprehensiveness of his vision. Uh, that um, he did not think just in terms of what we now regard as the basics of a university. Uh, he was interested in having art galleries and museums. Uh, he wanted the medical school to offer free clinics in Charlottesville for people who needed medical attention. Uh, he, uh, this is, I think, his most fun idea in the rotunda and it's had some, um, some publicity recently because they've tried to rec recreate it. He wanted to have a planetarium in the rotunda with a professor on a boomstick uh, guided by a student, uh, operated by a student, which seems pretty precarious, especially given some of the students in this period, uh, who would literally travel through the stars. He regarded astronomy as almost the mother of the sciences. And it's easy to think, and Jefferson insisted that science should be taught at the university. Uh, it was not at a lot of colleges. Um, and it's worth uh, realizing that for most universities at the time, the classical curriculum was still the basis. He wanted to have classics, but he wanted to have so much more taught. The word science at this time is more a way you approach knowledge rather than what today we would think of as, as pure sciences like chemistry and uh, biology and physics. Uh, Jefferson not only wanted those taught, but he insisted that subjects like Anglo-Saxon were essential for students to study. And he wanted students to have as broad an education as possible. He recommended no one should start studying law until they've spent at least three years studying other subjects. So I'm going to conclude by pointing out that this university had a real impact elsewhere. Now, it's always very difficult to demonstrate impact because uh, you know, people are influenced when they found an institution just like Jefferson himself, by a lot of different sources. Um, nevertheless, we can be very specific with some universities and indeed what was said at the time. I mentioned earlier that George Tickner was visiting the university along with Edward Everett, one of the other stars on the Harvard faculty, and tried to take it back to Harvard. Tigner said that although Jefferson was taking some of his ideas from France and Germany, that the very fact that he'd created this Republican university and created an elective curriculum uh, in America was very helpful to other American institutions because they could point to uh, one of their own. Um, Harvard remained so interested that soon after Jefferson died, the president of Harvard, Josiah Quincy, uh, tried to visit. And he got as far as Washington, and he had to turn back because, believe it or not, the university was on lockdown because of a typhoid epidemic. One of uh, Harvard's great uh, mid-19th century education reformers, Charles William Eliot, he... Uh, was one who became a big proponent of an elective curriculum, and he, uh, he acknowledged the influence of Jefferson and took a lot of interest in what Jefferson had done. And even as late as the 1960s, James Conant, the president of Harvard, did a book on Jefferson and education that he advocated should still remain a model in the United States. One of the professors here was William Barton, Rogers, who became the founding president of MIT, and his widow later remarked on how MIT was really created in the hallways of the University of uh, Virginia. The University of Michigan 
Its founder was greatly influenced by the University of Virginia, so is the University of Texas Austin, the State University in Florida. Indeed, Herbert Baxter Adams, one of the great historians at the time, he said uh, that he couldn't, um, that the University of Virginia was a huge influence, especially in the South, that is, his alumni had gone on to reform other universities in its own mold. So I want to end, as I end the book, with a quote from Jefferson. Uh, I'm closing the last scenes of life by fostering and fashioning an establishment for the instruction of those who are to come after us. I hope its influence on their virtue, freedom, fame, and happiness will be salutary and permanent. Uh, this was uh, written uh, no, just over a year before he died. And one of the key ideas to, of Jefferson was that each generation should think for itself. It should not be held back by the past, what he called the dead hand of the past. And they should devote themselves to improving their society around them. He predicted that he and his generation would one day be looked upon just like their witch-burning ancestors. He knew they would look dated, and he knew that others would revise his vision, as indeed he recommended that the Constitution be regularly rethought, uh, saying that you know, to build an institution or write a Constitution and expect it to carry on indefinitely is like expecting a man to wear the clothes of his boyhood for the rest of his life. Thank you very much. Now, I do have some questions that were sent ahead, but I thought I'd first ask if any of the audience, otherwise I'm happy to... Uh, uh, do these as people are coming up. One of the questions that came in from the audience was about whether Jefferson had any vision to educate women at the university. Uh, the answer is no, uh, and it's not entirely surprising. He wanted this university to educate the people who would later lead America. Remember, four of the first five presidents were, were Virginian. He sort of expected that that would continue. This was to be the leadership of the state and the country, and therefore it, it was particularly important to educate the uh, men. On the other hand, he recognized the importance of women's education in his education bill to give basic education. And we must always look at the context. There weren't opportunities for women in higher education at this Time. They came much later with uh, colleges like Grinnell. Uh, and suddenly, in the education of his own daughters, he really educated, gave them the best possible education and didn't give them an education focused on women, even though he would say that women should study the domestic arts. He actually never bothered to teach his own daughter, and she complained that when she had a family she suddenly had to start learning uh, a lot of these skills herself. Thanks for your perspectives today. Yes. Um, <clears throat> in terms of loca uh, locating the university, when, he went, when Jefferson went to Rockfish with yes. his agenda well in place and saying, I've got this Central College of Virginia all ready to go, um, is it accepted that in the day, the joint Virginia-West Virginia, that the geographic center was definitely much more towards the valley, probably around Stanton. Was that an understood, accepted thing, but yet he portrayed it as Charlottesville was a geographic center? Or perhaps it was the population center, which would be east, but uh, on he, that. He cheated. <laughs> he did. Uh, I, this, you know, the Stanton area and Lynchburg had a good claim. We forget that what 
is now the state of Western Virginia. It was part of Virginia, although much of it uh, undeveloped, but that area had good reasons to think that it would be the central part of the state. Uh, the College of what is now Washington and Lee, just known as the College of Washington at the time, that uh, had probably the strongest claim because they had a huge endowment and they had a donor willing to uh, give them uh, a great deal more if they became the University of uh, Virginia. Um, so for Jefferson, one of his critical arguments was saying that this was the most central part of the state. I said he cheated. One of the ways he cheated was he counted the free black population, not just the white population. And, uh, you know, the university went through several stages. He originally got onto the board of a defunct academy, which was really just like more of a prep school. Uh, he turned that into what he called Central College and managed to persuade all their trustees to resign so that he could appoint statewide trustees, including Madison, uh, as allies. And most of them actually became then the first uh, board of visitors at the university. And, uh, but it was a private college, Central College, and he insisted on the word central. He didn't want it being called Jefferson University. And uh, that was the point he was really trying to convey. At the Rockfish Gap Commission, he arrived with a cardboard cutout of the state and lots of statistics to show that this was absolutely the most central part of uh, Virginia. But I think the reason he wanted it here is partly just being able to control and oversee the project. He almost didn't trust anyone else. And he had many collaborators, whether in architecture with Benjamin Latrobe or with the university with Madison, Joseph Cabell, obviously, was a critical one. Uh, and I describe them in the book. Um, but there's no doubt he wanted to supervise it, uh, either visiting every day or watching it being built from Monticello. At the end of his life, mm. um, I had recently bumped into the fact that mm. um, Edgar Allan Poe went to his funeral yes. for the procession or something. And I wondered if there was any of his reflections of that, or was it a drug-addled day or something? <laughs> it's very sad. Poe writes nothing. He mentions nothing uh, about Jefferson uh, and... Uh, you know, the, one of the professors, George Long, who was uh, invited uh, to send his reflections to the 1875 alumni meeting, said he couldn't actually remember Edgar Allan Poe. The librarian remembered him very well, um, but seems to uh, have uh, overlooked some of his uh, weaknesses. He said he remembered as, as a sober and serious uh, person. Um, but it is true, uh, he was one of the few students to get to the funeral. Jefferson wanted his funeral to be small and private. And there was a quarrel within his family about it. He also wanted it to be virtually immediate. And there was also a quarrel between town and gown in Charlottesville. So the university created a pr procession to go up uh, from Court Square up to uh, Monticello, and then there was a, a public argument between them and the town leaders as to who went first in the procession. Uh, hierarchy was still very important, um, and they never got up here, but Poe just got on a horse or on his ran uh, and managed to arrive, uh, and it was a group of about 40 who students who actually got to see the event. But if um, uh, you know, Tirrett's correct that every student dined at Monticello, he must have dined there. And maybe in these descriptions of crumbling houses and so forth, uh, maybe uh, there are echoes. There's certainly echoes of the valley of the Blue Ridge Mountains in his work.
What would Jefferson's reaction be to, I guess it's the General Assembly's requirement that the student body has to be 70% Virginian and 30% uh, from the rest of the United States? That's number one. And number two, what would he feel about the way that admissions are currently handled, particularly with regard to equity issues and so forth? <laughs> Well, I, you know, I always try not to second guess how he would uh, deal today. There's no doubt he hopes that the university would uh, attract students very broadly within America, but he did understand it was predominantly for Virginians. Uh, and he was very upset that Kentucky could build Transylvania, which was a very good university with a lot of promising start, and that uh, the University of that Virginia, which he regarded as the greatest state in the Union, should not have a great institution, even though it was providing a lot of the leadership. Um, and uh, But it, it was important to him to attract people very broadly, and actually it was attracting people more broadly than Harvard, who for much of the early part of the 19th century took all their students, not only from Massachusetts, 90%, but largely from uh, Boston. The most um, kind of, uh, the ones with the biggest national base were Yale and Princeton. And that's partly because of the Presbyterians who were the most active group in founding universities and schools at the time, and also in uh, having college presidents. Uh, and so they had enormous influence. Uh, one of the reasons the University of Virginia was not more popular was because it was secular, and in the eyes of many atheists, uh, a big change was happening in Virginia as this university was being built. Uh, that there was a strong evangelical movement and uh, people were joining churches uh, at new rates. Uh, we tend today to talk about the South as the buckle on the Bible belt, at least in places like Texas, they use that term. But the buckle on the Bible belt was in the North in the early 19th century. Uh, the South um, I mean, you would not have been able to pass the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom 40 years later. It was possible, though, in Virginia at the time to do this very extreme separation of church and uh, state. But a lot of people would not send their children to uh, the university. It was being denounced as ungodly a reputation that the faculty felt they still had to defend right till late into uh, the 19th century. Yes. Hi, my name is Jay Jocelyn, and I'm uh, from the engineering school in our wonderful humanities department at the time. Hmm. Uh, uh, Jefferson might have objected to Washington College because of its Presbyterianism, I think. Yes. Which was rampant in the Shenandoah Valley and the rest of the state. Yeah, I'd like to just comment on that because a lot of, recently people have criticized him for voting against a plan of public education uh, put forward by a political uh, opponent, Charles Fenton Mercer, whose support was in the Shenandoah Valley, which was a lot more evangelical than the eastern part of the state, and Jefferson voted against it. But it's because he was extreme. He did not believe that clergy should even be allowed to teach in the schools. And he was particularly opposed to uh, Mercer because Mercer was firstly a Presbyterian and secondly was a Federalist. And his great fear was that they were getting the monopoly of all educational institutions in America. Uh, and it's rather bizarre because federalism, the political base, had been in the north. Uh, and yet, most of the southern universities were also so federalist. I'm one of the only Republican universities in the south was in uh, uh, it was the College of William and Mary. And he was obsessed about this because in the election of 1800, which no one has ever pointed out, coincides with the first 
time that he wrote that we need to found a University of Virginia to Joseph Priestley. In that election, uh, he was particularly bitter that the clergy in the North were especially virulent in their attacks, and especially the clergy who were college presidents. Uh, and Timothy Dwight was the most outspoken at Yale. He said uh, he'll have everyone in America an atheist and having to sing the Sara Ra, the song of the French Revolutionary Movement. Uh, and Dwight told students at Yale to pledge that they would never vote for Jefferson. And Jefferson believed that only he and the Republican Party represented the true spirit of 1776, and that unless the Federalists were bypassed and they lost their monopoly of education, then uh, you know, there was a real danger of, Brit of America reverting to being a British satellite and reintroducing monarchy, aristocracy, and so on. And that was a major reason for the founding of the university. Some have suggested that when he talks about the poison of the North, he must be referring to abolitionists. But we have to remember, in the 1790s, it was not the issue of slavery that chiefly split the North and South. And Federalists avoided it as a debating topic. Uh, and they certainly did nothing about it while in office under Washington and John Adams. Um, and that, that remains true even later. Those who've argued to the contrary quote Jefferson during the Missouri crisis, but significantly Jefferson was writing about the dangers of the North to a Federalist who he wanted to vote money in the legislature for the building of the rotunda. All right, my real question, and, uh, as it happens, mm -hmm. uh, I am uh, Presbyterian, and yes. I am from Charleston, the yes. other part of Virginia. Uh, but my real question is, uh, what was the impact of William Small on Jefferson? And he came, I guess, and impacted the University of Pennsylvania later? Yes. And so I, I've seen nothing, uh, I know, uh, other than those references, anything about him. He came to William and Mary. He must have been a square peg in a round hole there, because as Jefferson said later, uh, William and Mary, he gave up on William and Mary because it was full of uh, clergy, which right. was founded by the Anglican Church. Uh, so, um, what can you tell us about William Small? Well, first, uh, I do want to say I don't share all Jefferson's views. Uh, and I, I do not think he was fair entirely to the Presbyterians. He thought of them all as Calvinists. Well, right, and he exactly. And thought, he thought of them all as uh, Federalists. But, in fact, many in the South were not Federalists. Uh, and they did. We, we owe it to them. Uh, that they did found so many good schools and uh, colleges. And indeed, I give a little sense of the history of universities in the book. Religious uh, institutions are responsible for the modern university. Much of the language we use, even speaking about the rector, the provost, the degree ceremony, the name of degrees, uh, even wearing gowns are like vestments. Uh, this, you know, this derives ultimately from the Catholic Church. As of William Small, who was a huge influence on Jefferson, they used to meet almost daily and in social contexts. And he was the only lay professor, as you rightly point out, at the College of William and Mary. Uh, he was unhappy. And in many ways, the fact that he didn't stay must have been part of Jefferson's turning against his alma mater, because he was certainly very unfair to it. He wanted to close it all together and to take its endowment for the University of uh, Virginia. Uh, and the point about Small is that he was familiar with the sciences and taught a very broad curriculum. So he really exposed Jefferson, um, especially to some of the ideas of the Scottish Enlightenment, which are manifest in documents like the Declaration of Independence, you know, the pursuit of happiness, uh, the belief that uh, humans are basically benign uh, and good, uh, and that in many ways society and governments are what 
corrupt, uh, well, corrupt them. Hmm. Anything else about Small's career in the United States? Well, I, it lasted a very short time, as you rightly point out, and he returned to England. Uh, he joined the famous Lunar Society in Birmingham, of which Joseph Priestley was another member. Priestley, to whom Jefferson first wrote, saying we need to found a University of Virginia. Uh, he was the father of the Unitarian movement and also uh, is credited with the development of ideas on oxygen, a very important scientist. Um, and uh, that was a bit like the American Philosophical Society in America, a very important uh, club. Uh, what was interesting for me writing the book was to realize that research and new developments weren't being done by universities uh, for the most part in the 18th century. They were being done by scientific organizations. Uh, it took a long time for science to be properly incorporated into curriculum at, at Yale, which actually became very good. The person they chose to teach chemistry had absolutely no knowledge of the subject. Uh, they paid for him to go to the University of Edinburgh in actual fact, he turned out to be an outstanding scientist, but they weren't prepared to go and get someone in Europe, as Jefferson did. Only one of Jefferson's eight faculty were born within the United States. Uh, all the others uh, essentially were outsiders, um, and which is good, because we have a lot of correspondence and memoirs of them with which to build up our picture of the university. But he died, unfortunately, regrettably, before uh, Jefferson really gained his fame. Small. Yes. You, mean, you mean William Small? William Small, yes. But did he come back to the University of Never Pennsylvania? came back to America. I thought he had some influence on the University of Pennsylvania somehow. Um, that's possible. Uh, okay. Through one of his protégés, but he never came back. Okay. Thank you. I think Althea's going to shut me down. <laughs> well, we just want to say thank you to Andrew O'Shaughnessy. We have a small gift for you. Thank you. Um, this program was brought to you by the Lifetime Learning Program um, in partnership with the Alumni Association. So we want to thank you all for coming out and joining us online and enjoy the game. Thank you all.